I hope you can hear me. Thank you, Lazzo, and thank you, Andres. I, I mean, we, we organized last, last year with my team this uh, conference, and I remember how much work this was, and it's just spectacular. It's this size of people, just wonderful. Um, it is, uh, I, I, I couldn't figure out the Provost is gone. If this room is called hell or heaven, because some say it was called hell, others heaven. Anyway, I thought I, I make a positive title and, and it's called Traditions at New Beginnings and an optimistic view of the future of psychotherapy research. And uh, before I really begin, I, I would like to say many thanks to a lot of people and this list is, is not really complete. Uh, I, I want to say thanks to, to Ken Howard, he's my, my, I did my postdoc with him. Uh, I, I probably wouldn't have stayed in academia without him. Michael Barkham coming back to Europe, uh, it was extremely helpful. A, a lot of other people uh, on the mental level, but we have also collaborators, friends and colleagues. Soren Martinovic in the early, I will, I will talk about the research program going over about 30 years. So, so and uh, Jamie, Dana, Kim, uh, Johan Martin in recent years up to students, uh, former students, Jan Bünke, Julian Rubel especially. Uh, we do research for so many years together. And of course, the TRIA team, uh, especially the, the research team is here. Anne kathrin Deisenhofer, Brian Schwarz, Danilo Mocha, Miriam Hehlmann, Steffen Eberhardt, Jana Schaffrat and Jana Bommer. Um, and the others are at, at home. It's more the clinical group, so the research group is here. Uh, Stefanie Vakarazza is just, just new in the team for half a year. And of course, I want to thank all former students. So they come from, of course, Switzerland and Germany, Israel, uh, Holland, and, and several countries, uh, more Australia. And of course, my family, uh, not, uh, of course, last but not least, Birgit, who is here, my wife and my twin daughters, Teresa and, and Catherine. And of course, all patients and trainees who supported this research over the many years. Now, it is, I did my diploma, which is kind of a master today, 30 years ago in 1993. And in preparing this talk, I, um, I thought, is it possible to summarize all this, what I did in these 30 years in like one or, or maybe two sentences? And, and uh, in, in doing, in, uh, in searching for a sentence, I, I, I came to this chapter we did together. Um, yeah, and you see here, this is uh, the chapter four in the handbook of the Bergen and Garfel Handbook of Psychotherapy and Behavior Change. And you see all on the side, uh, it's done with Kim de Jong, Julian and, and uh, uh, Jamie. And you see all on the side how happy we were when this finally came out. And I think this one sentence basically is this one. The measurement of change in psychotherapy has developed considerably. Uh, in the early days, the main question was whether change in psychotherapy could be measured at all. And the main question now concerns how change can be optimally measured, how often uh, should, be, should it be measured, and how therapists can make the best use of change measures in clinical practice and training. And, and you will see the the rest of the talk that are coming back to these kind of issues uh, all the time. And is it actually possible to hear me go? Is it, should I go closer? Is it good? Okay. Um, and to bring this all in one or like a series of pictures, uh, I, I chose those from, uh, um, from, from this called Pillars of Creation. This is an area in the, in the sky, in the space, about four to five uh, light years away. And you can see if you look with, the, with, the, with your eyes just in this direction, you don't see much. But with the Hubble telescope, you, you see much better in this area. And, uh, and with the new James Webb telescope. So the improvement of measurement, we can learn from this. And I, I think this in some way is also an idea for psychotherapy research, at least what I tried to follow over so many years. And uh, to come back to our field, um, and, and you can see this is like, a, like steps up, which can be do, done in practice uh, over, um, and if you start here with the number five, 
It's intuitive judgment. That's what we usually do as clinicians uh, when we see patients. But the idea of psychotherapy research in some way is a little bit to move up these stairs. So from pre to post measure, repeated measurements, uh, session by session reports, uh, lots of the research I'm showing in the following uh, over, over this whole period. Uh, this is on session by session reports and up to intensive longitudinal assessment or even analysis of videotapes. I'll, I'll come back to this at the end, uh, giving some outlook. Um, and of course, as more you do this, uh, as more you go a little bit away from the intuitive judgment, it more challenges gets to implement this into practice, as more knowledge therapists need from this research background. And I think this is an important task actually for our society too, to, to transfer, to give this knowledge into clinical practice. Uh, and, and as more this information can be used for decision, for clinical decision support, not to replace clinical decisions, but to support this, uh, the, these decisions. And I'll, I'll come back uh, to this. And I, first, uh, I, I would like to give a short, yeah, very, very short <laughs> history uh, 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 of psychotherapy research and where we are now, in a way, and, and then I'll give talk more about measurement, treatment, personalization, and feedback research, uh, covering then the more application implementation side in clinical practice. And I will give at the end some new developments and some discussions or ideas, uh, what I think that might be ideas for the future in, in thinking and doing research uh, in, this, in this direction. And uh, to start, I would like to start with these two SPR traditions. For me, it's a little bit the uh, yeah, Howard and Orlinsky traditions in a way. It's the, the outcome and feedback tradition. And I've mentioned here a few people in, in our society for both tracks, uh, also from, from traditionally, but also in, in the last years have done research. But I could almost add all members here to one of these tracks or most did like both of these tracks. Now on the side you see Ken Howard um, and, uh, and this the, the, is basically and I did most of my research in the area of uh, outcome, outcome research but also covered the process area and uh, you see also the process and mechanisms which is I call it a little bit the, the Olinsky track. Now go back to the outcome outcome tradition. We all know psychotherapy research or psychotherapy works, uh, as Christoph often uh, says. And, uh, uh, or all, and we have man many, many meta-analysis uh, showing this. I mean, Bruce Wampel, Grim Kuipers. But we also, it is also in comparison to a lot of medical treatments. Uh, like, like I have here a few examples. This is a table also from this, uh, the already mentioned chapter in, in the handbook. And uh, for example, corticosteroid uh, treatment of chronic asthma, or uh, in comparison, for example, uh, copaxone treatment of relapse remitting multiple sclerosis. So psychotherapy works, and also in comparison to a lot of medical treatments very well, um, and also in comparison, at least in the long run, to psychopharmacological treatment, especially for depression and anxiety. Um, but we all know it doesn't work for all. And we also know it does work in practice. So this is a study we did uh, a few years back uh, where we basically just co compared uh, RCT findings uh, versus practice-based evidence. And here you can see the effect sizes uh, for just a regular outpatient uh, clinic, uh, our clinic in Trier at the University of Trier uh, with its about uh, 0.88 and we compared this to one of the first large RCT, the treatment of depression collaborative research program. Uh, Irene Elkin uh, was, was the head uh, of, this, of this research program and they compared IPT as an interpersonal treatment and CBT and, and the effect sizes were very high. So if you, if you have just an unadjusted sample in your clinic, yeah, 
th then it is definitely lower what the effect sizes are. But if you go up and you adjust it in terms of the inclusion, exclusion criteria uh, for, for done in this study, so you select especially depressed people uh, and, and you check out the inclusion, exclude bipolar patients and so on, uh, and or the exclusion criteria, and then you move up and you do even a propensity score matching. So you, you check out basically the, the uh, uh, impairment scores at the end, the dysfunctional attitudes, and you make a one-to-one -one matching. You check the case in the RCT and see you the optimal match uh, in, in this uh, um, um, uh, evidence-based or in this uh, outpatient center sample, and you see you get a very similar result. Uh, so what we see here, it is uh, psychotherapy works also in practice. Um, and also we know there are therapists on outcome, on treatment length, or therapist's effects, and, and dropout. This is the study we did uh, a few years back in the uh, German health insurance company. And, and what you see here is like uh, individual therapists and their effects on treatment outcome. So higher scores are here, effect sizes, uh, their effects on outcome, on treatment length, so higher scores are here, uh, shorter treatments and uh, less dropouts. And as you can see here, for example, uh, well, first I should say they do not correlate with outcome. So um, uh, uh, even so the, the therapist effects in terms of treatment length and, and attrition, they correlate a little bit, but, but not with the outcome, therapist effects on outcome. And what you see here is, the results of this. We have a therapist here. It's kind of a super shrink. Yeah, uh, it has uh, this. This therapist has a high outcome effect. It's all controlled for initial impairment and uh, short treatments and a low dropout rate. Now here we have a therapist, for example, in this sample, uh, which has a, not such a good result. Has a, a low low effect in terms of outcome. Uh, high dropout rate and long treatments. But especially interesting is also this group here. Uh, we have like therapists who have a very high effect size, who do very well, yeah, independent of how impaired patients are, they treat, um, but they have like an average treatment length, but they have a high dropout rate. So it's interesting for some, some patients, they seem not to stay, but for those patients which stay in treatment, they, they, these therapists are doing very well. So, and uh, yeah, I, I'll, I'll mention once in a while in between presentations who, who want to see more and hear more on these topics uh, from, from students or colleagues. I'm, I'm involved in the research and Ann-Kathrin Deisenhofer and Miriam Hailman, uh, they, they will give a talk during SPR on this issue. Uh, and now I'm coming to the process side. And I, when Michael asked me to, do, uh, to lead the, the first chapter uh, in the handbook, I was a little bit concerned, could I do this? And, and I, I was going back to the first chapter of the uh, Bergen and Garfield Handbook of Psychotherapy Research from 1971. This is the chapter written by Urban and Ford. And, and, and they said, I really, I really like that psychotherapy did not develop in a continuous way. Uh, after the first psychological interventions emerged at the end of the 19th century, the development was not a simple linear progression toward more precise and effective procedures and change strategies. Instead, it was lateral, uh, meaning that many different variants of psychotherapeutic treatments or treatment orientations were introduced. And this, of course, we all know this, this holds until today. And, and if you look to this, uh, how this looks in practice, we have here the uh, Society of Clinical Psychology, APA, a list of uh, empirical uh, supported treatments. And you can see here, alone for depression, uh, quite a large group of treatments or different treatments who have like, uh, yeah, modest or strong research support, which, which does mean in the end, we don't know which treatment would be best for which kind of patient. And if you look to the third wave developments, so-called third wave demand, we have a similar situation in the CBT tradition, uh, the ACT, behavioral activation, CBASP, DBT, 
or we have this also in the psychodynamic tradition or in the humanistic tradition uh, when we look at mentalization based therapy or emotion focused therapy they all come with their own disorder and change theories they, they come up with professional organizations or associations and training guidelines but we have still limited knowledge uh, of differential effects mediators or the causal network uh, of, of process outcome relationships. And if you look more into this box, and I'm just doing this here for the CBT treatment strategies, but I, it could be also done for psychodynamic uh, or humanistic approaches or systemic approaches. And if you look into this, so we have like the traditional treatment strategies uh, coming, going back to behavior therapy uh, or cognitive therapy, exposure, uh, classical behavior therapy, uh, and but cognitive appraisal, reappraisal, this would be a cognitive strategy. But now in these days, it gets more and more advanced and, and we come, come to acceptance, mindfulness, uh, or, and, and the uh, emotion-focused uh, elements, which are also included in this, uh, as well as um, larger level uh, strategies like, like motivational clarification, problem actualization, or ther the therapeutic uh, relationship and resource activation. Now, we could actually start to unbox this and think in a more trans-theoretical uh, uh, direction if we want to. It, it might work. This is, for example, the strategy we use where we, in our clinic, as, as a guideline for our training program, where we basically use researched areas and processes and, and here I mentioned a couple of names in this area uh, who did some research on these processes as the basis uh, for the training program. But uh, for clinical training and also, of course, for, for clinical practice. But if we do this, uh, and we might should be moving slowly in this direction. I know this is a, a, a tricky topic, but even if we do this, it doesn't necessarily improve our treatments. And I think what, what's additionally necessary is like a measurement-based or data-informed uh, strategy. So going away from simple RCTs, uh, doing treatment comparisons and, and looking for average effects and adding more and more treatment approaches uh, to, to a stronger focus on patients at risk uh, for treatment failure. So for those clients and patients where we do not see progress yet. Uh, and, and we can actually do this already using decision support tools uh, developed in, in feedback research, e-mental health, uh, and, um, um, and also modern machine learning algorithms. And I will explain this a little bit more uh, in the following. Um, but all this should be staying in the hands of the clinician. So we talk about a scientifically trained therapist um, but, but these decision tools do not the decision. The therapist does the decisions. Um, and of course, we have a large, or we are faced with a large patient and setting variability uh, in our field. And we need, of course, international collaborations and SPI is the, the best place for this uh, to do cross validations in different uh, cultures and, and settings, of course. So I'm now coming to the, the measurement uh, issue, personalization and feedback. How would this look like? And, and we handle this, the, we, we have the scientist practitioner gap, as, as I already described it in a way. So on one side, as a practitioner, we do some intuitive personalization and adaptation to our clients and patients. Uh, and, and from the research strategy, we are more interested in standardization and average effects, which leads us to the, is this treatment effective on average? And to this list of treatments I just showed you before. Now, the, the idea of a treatment personalization or an evidence-based treatment personalization, this would be more the question, is this therapy effective or treatment effective for this specific patient? And it has like two components to tailor treatment. So it is on the personalized treatment strategy or uh, treatment selection at the beginning and uh, or on the 
patient-focused feedback research or the monitoring during treatment. So it has a prediction element as well as the monitoring element. And I'm, I'm coming back to this uh, in, in the following. And all what I'm presenting now goes back to like, like my own 30 years of psychotherapy research program, I, which I've done in mostly with, with samples in, from the US, the UK, Switzerland, and Germany, uh, and a couple of other countries on, on expected treatment response, therapist effects, and dropout research, and, and patterns of change, early response, sudden gains, and sudden losses, uh, and as well as routine outcome monitoring and measurement-based and data-informed psychological therapy. This is all, if you want to see it that way, like integrated in the whole 50-year tradition also of the, the handbook. Uh, and also, I'll, 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 just, just Jamie uh, Delgadilla and me, we just uh, did an, uh, um, a chapter on precision mental health care for depression, uh, for the APA handbook on, uh, of depression. And, and we, we selected different strategies or research strategies uh, looking for pre pre precision in uh, uh, or treatment selection, adaptation, and precision mental health. And this is what, what people have tried over the years. So selecting treatment packages or protocols. And, and you can see a couple of examples here, uh, uh, like the Personalized Advantage Index, uh, uh, Zach Cohen, Rob DeRubis did introduce. We use often the nearest neighbor concept uh, with a couple of prognostic models. The selection of treatment strategies and modules or processes, um, as well as uh, using intensive longitudinal assessments to personalize treatment. Uh, th there's also research on therapist uh, patient matching and, of course, the routine outcome monitoring. I'm covering not all of these areas, but quite a few over, over my talk. And I, I would uh, also start or like to start with the treatment prediction. Uh, or treatment selection, treatment strategy selection part in the context of a system we call the TRIA Treatment Navigator. So the basic research we did over the years was implemented into a software which is also used in our clinical training program and in clinical practice, uh, making use of this kind of, of research. And the treatment uh, or the pre-treatment recommendations at the beginning, they, they provide dropout recommendations as well as treatment strategy recommendations at the beginning. I'm coming then later to the, to the personalized adaptive uh, recommendations. And this goes a little bit back to research done in 2005, 2006 in Switzerland. Uh, it's a little bit similar to predicting avalanches in Switzerland. It's quite hot here, so it's not a real topic, but in Switzerland, as they do predicting avalanches, they use information from a lot of days on one mountain, how wet the snow is, how much snow there is. And then they select, if a new day comes along, they select the uh, closest days and use the nearest neighbors, the nearest days, and make a prediction if there is a, an avalanche or not uh, in this. And when there is on seven days, uh, the seven closest days an avalanche, it would be like a high, uh, um, probability for an avalanche and this uh, skiing area would be closed. Now we are interested not in snow depth, so, so we have more impairment, the diagnosis, the chronicity of patients, I mean how long patients have that problem already, um, if they had previous psychotherapy treatment and use those predictors to search for the closest cases already treated in our sample. And, and this little animation showed you how this looks like. Now it's multidimensional, but you have a case and you search for the closest already treated ones and you make a prediction is in, in this study, is it better to do a CBT protocol based uh, treatment or is it better to do a combined CBT IPT treatment as we did in this, in this study. And, uh, and you can see if you do this, you can do individualized predictions. Yeah, based on the case, a new patient comes into treatment, you search already in your database, what is the best option in terms of treatment for this case, uh, or is there another option uh, for, for, for the next case? And here you see two examples where we did this. On average, the two treatments were not different, uh, 
but for about a third of the cases, there was a difference. And as you can see here, for example, one, uh, you see uh, there's an, the red line shows a better prediction. You have that already at the beginning. Uh, before treatment, a better prediction for the combined CBT and IPT treatment, uh, whereas on case two, on the left side, uh, you see a better prediction uh, for the treatment with CBT for that specific client. Uh, and we did a lot of different evaluation studies using these uh, kind of techniques over the years. So I, I have been involved in a couple of more uh, of, of those prediction studies using different technologies, different algorithms, machine learning algorithms. Uh, you can see here just an overview of those uh, uh, with different disorders like PTSD patients, uh, and uh, from, from diff uh, samples from different countries. And, um, and at the end, so you see here four studies who, who predict different treatments, whereas the last study does predict different treatment strategies. And I'm come back to this study. So we make a difference. So it's a point of, about a 0.3 difference uh, here, 0.34 on average, if those kind of models are used but we have not many prospective or cross-evaluation studies. And the last one is one, I'll, I'll come back to this. Uh, uh, this is a, another study where we used, just recently done uh, with uh, Paulina uh, gonzalez salas and, and Jamie Delgadillo on predicting dropout here with a huge database of 80,000 people from the IAPT service. And as you can see, you can use those models also to predict dropout. So not only the optimal treatment strategy, but to predict maybe the optimal treatment strategy that they get the optimal dose. Um, and, and this is how it looks like in this kind of research, how it is applied in our training program in, in our outpatient center. So this is a uh, uh, this navigation system, how it is used in practice. And you see this is an estimated dropout probability at the, so, so when, when patients come into treatment, they fill out questionnaires at the intake, and then you have this information. This is like the average dropout rate in the clinic, and then you can compare the dropout probability for this specific client. Now, if this client has a higher dropout probability, of course, it makes sense for the therapist to watch the motivation and to look for potential dropout. And it also provides uh, specific uh, treatment strategy recommendations. Like in this case, is it better to, based on the nearest neighbors or of those already treated, is it better to have a motivation-oriented treatment strategy or is it better to have a problem-solving uh, treatment strategy at the start of treatment? Or is it, is it air or mixed? We could either, either one or the other. What's the better option? So it's uh, what kind of treatment strategy is optimal? Now, in this case, for this example, it is uh, motivation-oriented uh, treatment strategy, just for one case. Um, I'm now moving on to the second part, not the prediction part, but the monitoring part. So checking if, the, if we do make progress and to identify cases at risk for treatment failure, uh, going back to, to feedback and routine outcome monitoring research. And uh, it also goes back to research on early response or early negative response and using these as indicator for potential negative outcome. I'm coming back to this. There's quite some research on, on early response in different setting, diagnosis, and, and, and with different instruments. And of course, we know, and, and there's a lot of research in this area, that feedback reduces uh, the number of non-responding patients with a small effect, but an add-on effect to already uh, effective treatments. And it is especially helpful for patients which go off track, which have a risk for negative treatment outcome. And, when, and if clinical support tools are used. So Mike Lambert, of course, uh, did, did a huge amount of research in this, and uh, Michael, uh, uh, Kim, Jamie, and me, we just, just worked on a, on a meta-analysis, on, on an overview paper on this, uh, coming up with this differences in success rate, uh, if, if therapists use these kind of technology. And we have an implementation issue in this area, too. So uh, there are moderators, that's the type and frequency of feedback, 
and how it is accepted. And I, I come back to this acceptance issue uh, in, in the rest of my talk too. Now here you see what do therapists actually do with this, with this feedback. Uh, this is a study we did in Germany, supported by an insurance company. And, uh, and you see about 70% they use this information for clinical practice. This was a study done with practitioners all across Germany. And, uh, and they, they discussed, especially for those cases which were potentially not successful, had a, a, um, a pr probability for, for being not successful or no change. And uh, they discussed the results uh, with, with their patients. Uh, they, they adjusted their treatment uh, interventions. Uh, they worked on the alliance, so that was significantly different. Uh, if, if we ask the same question in our training center, th there's also one thing which pops out. It is uh, this point consulting additional sources, which is actually the supervisors. So our trainees use this information often for their supervision uh, purposes. And, and this is also an interesting part. It is, there's a differential effect on attitudes toward the usage of such feedback. And uh, in this case, so what th the attitude of the therapist uh, about the feedback and how satisfied this is a component uh, is how satisfied are you with the with this feedback system and the number of modifications uh, are done or what, what do therapists do with this with these modifications. And as you can see here, basically, uh, if, if therapists are not satisfied with this with this kind of um, outcome monitoring, but they do a lot of reactions to it. So they kind of overreact. They get a little bit in panic. So they don't like using this kind of information, but they do a lot. Uh, th those therapists have the, the lowest effect sizes uh, in this study. So, so this seems to be the implementation issue, how well this is perceived and how well this is actually used in uh, a clinical uh, practice. And you see the patient side here on the other side. If you ask patients how it, I find it important to monitor uh, the results of ther therapeutic, therapeutic treatments, and you see about over 90% th they think that's completely right or rather right. So from the patient perspective, this is really important that something like this is actually done in, in practice. Uh, and and we, we develop based on this information also risk indices. So I, I talked about early response, but here in this case, which is more the early response side, is more the right side of about positive feedback, but also if what happens if patients fall below a predicted failure boundary uh, here and, and how extreme they fall below this boundary be between session two and seven, what happens to those at the end of treatment after session 20? And, and you can see as more often they fall and more extreme, they fall below this failure boundary here, uh, as more likely it is they have no change or negative treatment outcome. So this can be used for an indicator uh, or a risk index to indicate early in treatment if the treatment is working or not working. And, and, and that's what we actually do in our uh, program, in our training program, that's what we apply. Uh, we have developed uh, a dynamic failure boundary is more advanced. This was the study I showed you before. This is like the status of around 2006, uh, 2010, this area. Now we recently developed this more dynamic uh, or adaptive risk index, which is adapted at each session based on this nearest neighbors and the change uh, each patient has uh, up to that point. And if, a third, if the patient goes beyond that risk index here, it indicates a higher likelihood for a negative treatment outcome. And this gives like a warning for therapists. You, you, maybe you should do, you should look at this, at this client more in depth. And as we see it, uh, and as we saw it, that, that implementation plays a role and what therapists do with it. So they should not get into panic, but to make an informed decision using some information. And then we provide actually in, in several areas, additional information. Is it, is it a problem in the, in the area of risk, suicidality? Uh, is it a problem in motivation, treatment goals, potentially? Uh, is it a, a problem in therapeutic alliance? 
Is it the social support or um, critical life events uh, which, which happened during treatment, which, which made this kind of going into this risk area? Uh, or is it emotion regulation, self-regulation issues? And, uh, and then therapists can click on this specific area and they get additional information what they might can do in this area. So for example, this is shows part of that, that information. It's all available, available on the internet. Uh, and for example, if, if we know, okay, this patient has a risk for negative outcome. Yeah, and the patient says, I wonder what I'm act doing in therapy. Actually, I find it boring. Yeah, I, we all know something should be done. We can't just continue. Uh, and, and then this offers the additional programs and modules uh, to help to deal with this. Uh, and then therapists can go into depth and can also use this information for intervention or for exchanging with colleagues or for supervision purposes uh, in, in, in our training program, for example. And there's also, of course, a lot of material which can be downloaded, like homework uh, or video clips here on the lines ruptures. Uh, we see Chris Moran, we translated this, this video, uh, or all, all kinds of, of other kinds of tools. Uh, which can be used. Um, here, application and implementation. How, how can this be studied in clinical practice? And we did a, a prospective trial on this, uh, which just was published uh, last year in JCCP, uh, where we actually tested in an RCT this, this kind of procedure and if it does make a difference. And uh, I'm not going too much into detail on this study. It's, about 538 cases, uh, and but what you can see here, the recommendation at the beginning uh, does work. So if therapists follow these recommendations they get at the beginning, uh, it seems that uh, is it is it problem solving or, to, or motivational oriented, and as clearer the recommendation is, so as clear as the statistical difference is, and therapists follow this kind of uh, recommendation, as more difference it makes for patients. Um, so it is not necessary that they follow, they can overrule the system, but it is recommended uh, to make it in a, in a meaningful sense to make a use of this kind of information. And as you can see, as larger the difference is in terms of the predictions and the effect differences, as higher the, the effect size uh, is for, in, you see this here, in different outcome instruments. So it's not only the outcome instrument, uh, which was the main uh, uh, mainly used in the study, but also the OQ30 uh, and a couple of PHQ9 and, and other outcome instruments. So it is consistent. And for the feedback part, it's very interesting. We saw an interaction with the therapist rated usefulness. So as more useful therapists perceive this kind of procedure, and uh, as more effect does it have, and that's especially interesting for the not on track cases. Because if therapists find this useful and, uh, and we know the case is not on track, has a risk for negative outcome, and, and, they, and they use this system, uh, it, it seems uh, they come to almost the same effects uh, as if for the on track cases, so the positive developing uh, cases. And what's also interesting, it depends how confident therapists feel in using such a system. So to what extent do you feel confident in your ability to use psychometric feedback. And as you can see, as higher confident therapists feel with this, as higher the, the effect sizes at the end. Uh, and I will have Julian uh, Rubel will, will give a presentation on other mediation effects on within uh, uh, effects of feedback. So uh, I'm coming now to the new developments. What, what, how are we doing in time? 20 more minutes. Okay. Okay, good. So thank you. <laughs> Sorry, so there's no clock around here. So. Uh, okay. So I, I still have time for some new developments, actually. Excellent. Um, now, this is already implemented and we have tested it prospectively. Uh, but I, I want to tell you a little bit on new developments and, and uh, new studies we are planning and, and at the moment conducting. Now, one is on to improve the implementation purpose uh, using deliberate practice uh, aspects and training. Uh, 
and, and also to improve the precision with machine learning algorithms or different ones, as well as uh, improving the measurements uh, using uh, uh, EMA, ecological monthly assessments, or even multi-model uh, video analysis. And this is uh, the deliberate practice part. And uh, so we have developed little video clips for, for trainees to use this in this different area. So if we know there is a risk uh, for this client and it is uh, for, for negative outcome, and we also know, okay, in, in this area, there might be also a problem. Is it suicidality, uh, motivation, therapy goals, risk means uh, trial alcohol, uh, alcohol or drug abuse. So if there are indications here of motivation, therapy goals, so we have like a bunch of clips they can train and can use this also uh, as part of their supervision uh, process. Uh, and we'll, if you're interested, we'll, we'll have a couple of uh, presentation at this SPR meeting from Jana Bommer, uh, Susanne Edelblut, uh, and uh, Birgit working in this some are more on case conceptualization, but in this area of in-depth looking on, on, on this training part. And this, the second thing is improving precision. So this is then going a little bit more from this clinical side to more the statistical machine learning side and testing different algorithms going beyond this uh, early machine learning algorithm of nearest neighbors. Now in this study, uh, a student of mine, Bjorn Benemann, uh, he did like testing like 45 different machine learning algorithms to improve the prediction of dropout. Uh, and as you can see here in the 2043 cases and, and uh, was tested then on 500 cases. And indeed the best machine learning algorithm did indeed better uh, than, than the traditional ones. So we'll have in this line of research not only on dropout, but also in prediction of treatment processes or strategies. I will also have Danilo Mocha, uh, Jana Schafrat, Juan Martis Gomez Penedo, Robin Wester, and Stephanie Vacaraza uh, starting working in, in this in this or continue working in this in this direction. Uh, and now I'm coming back to this nice picture uh, on improving measurements, and uh, and we, we also do a, an EMA study. Uh, where we can we use like repeated or uh, very intensive longitudinal assessments at the beginning of treatment, maybe in the waiting list. Can we use that information to improve our predictions, for example, for dropout? And we have done a study using networks a few years back uh, where we were indeed able better, uh, to better predict dropout rates using this um, uh, yeah, intensive longitudinal assessments versus cross-sectional assessments, uh, but we will have now a new project in, in this area where we're testing uh, like on a larger sample um, and uh, we also try to use um, these variables and to see if we can even improve our feedback. Now, for example, this client was wearing such a variable and is also indicating stress level and this was a, a patient as a, a, a hairdresser and always had a lot of a stressful client. This shows you the stress level 24 hours a day and over two weeks. And you can see like specific clients who have been uh, very, very, uh, very stressful for that, that client. So we'll see if that can work and this could maybe in the future be implemented, but we'll see. Uh, and Miriam Hillman, Mila Hall and Jan Bünke, Jan Bünke more on the measurement side, uh, will also have presentations on, in, this, in this area. Uh, I, I'm coming back to uh, this, uh, oops, well, anyway, it, the next step we, we, we're using is like video analysis. So we use the videos, we have a large database of videos because each session gets videotaped over many years and, and we do multimodal video analysis. So we use like the, the, the automatized transcripts of the video sessions, as you can see here, as well as the, the uh, emotion recognition. Uh, as well as like the movements uh, um, and, and the audio clip. And we, we can also uh, 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 have like locks between those and how good they synchronize patient and therapist. So this is the next step. We were a little bit slow because the diarization between therapist and patient took longer to, to process. 
but we are now there and we started to have the, the first study. Uh, um, it's just, just submitted in this area. And it's just, just a simple sentiment analysis of just the text basis, just the text uh, of the session. And uh, it is sentiments, it's like positive, negative sentiments with a large language model. Uh, and you can see that these correlate very high with uh, after session assessments of positive and negative uh, emotions, as you can see here. But what's also very interesting, these sentiments, they also correlate very high with the uh, uh, after session report we use, like something like the, the, uh, a short version of the SCL90, the symptom checklist, like a depression scale. So the, the correlation between those sentiments uh, is as high as the, uh, this self-report measure has, to the, has with the therapist report, uh, with this the global assessment of functioning. They also correlate about 0.5 with each other. So that's an interesting development also in how are we able to build up processes also with these kind of uh, measures and, and using this on a multi-layer, in a multi-layer version. Dan Arzels Florenim, for example, does a lot of research in this area too, and many others in this society. So I'm coming to the end, and this is the discussion. Uh, I, I think our treatments might be, will be, we'll see, be more oriented on precision, uh, maybe more also on trans-theoretical concept, uh, as well as measurement and data-based. And uh, with hopefully a, a focus more on patients at risk for treatment failure. So not just focusing on average differences with adding more and more uh, treatment approaches, including new technologies, measures and, and designs, and, and to see research also as part of clinical training, as well as identity. Um, and, and what's of course at the end also a word of caution. Uh, so it is to use data for the benefit of patient and transparency, and it is to support human decision-making. Yeah, I think that's an important thing, especially if we talk about AI, machine learning algorithms. It's to support decision-making. It does not replace. So it's a an, an, an data-informed treatment. I think that's an important point to make. Uh, so what's the future? Uh, I think further improvement of measures, implementation, uh, networks of research clinics. Uh, well, a couple of initiatives started already at SPR um, and, and to, to be able to, to compare settings and uh, cultures, minority groups, underserved populations, and especially to do prospective studies. So testing this in, in specific or different implementation areas. So basically that is this, that is it. Many thanks. Okay. Hey.